doctor in the TARDIS. Next stop everywhere. Stop everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast. I'm one of your co-hosts, Charles Skaggs, back in the TARDIS once again with my wonderful co-host, my wonderful partner in time, everybody's pal, Jesse Jackson. How you doing, Jesse? I am great, Charles. I was pausing I, um, for dramatic effect there. I know. I like that. I, I'm wondering if you will be the grumpy person today because it sounds like you may not have... Um, you may not have a lot of love for, uh, you can't love Orphan 55. You know, you can't drive yes. Yes. Uh, 55. You can't love Orphan 55. I can't love Orphan 55. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes, we are talking, uh, the third episode of the new season of the Dr. Um, I love episode. how you just stepped all over my intro. That's awesome. Yes. And so, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, hey, you know, I used to drive. I know you did. Yeah. If, if you ever want to drive, that's cool. I'm I'm cool no, with that. No. But, but uh, yeah, so episode well, 167 here of Next Stop Everywhere. We're talking Orphan 55, of course, everybody. So uh, written by Ed Heim, who uh, wrote the series 11 episode, It Takes You Away. Directed by Lee Haven Jones who directed the previous episode, Spyfall Part Do. And uh, this is the third episode of Series 12, aired just a few days ago on January 12th, 2020. Takes a little practice saying that now after saying 2019 all year. <laughs> and um, and uh, obviously this is another outing, of course, with Jodie Whittaker as the 13th Doctor, Bradley Walsh, Tosin Cole, Mandeep Gill as the fam. And uh, looking forward to talk about this one with you. This one has been slightly controversial in the far, at least as far as um, reviews being decidedly mixed on this one. So I'm curious about your take on this one. Yeah, the reason why I um, stepped over your introduction. Go for it. Is right before we hit record. Yes. You made a comment about. Um, if the writing was better yes. <laughs> and uh, this episode is um, IMDB mm -hmm. has it ranked at 4.6 out of 10, which I think is a little harsh. I think it's a little, yeah, unfair. I think that's a little harsh too. I, th I think that's a, that's a, the, you know, a certain segment of so-called fans. Yes. Um, doing another organized hit job on Dr. Who. Because I, I don't think this episode is that bad. I think it's actually okay. Yeah, I. What is your What is your thoughts about this? Yeah, I thought it was fine. Um, friend of the podcast and all around great guy Ken Schaefer. Yeah. Um, watches Doctor Who with his son Parker, and Parker is a very. He wants Doctor Who to feature. Monsters and scariness. Well, there you go. He doesn't like evil businessmen or right. anything this else. And so I thought of this. I went, Parker's going to really like this episode. Right. So, yeah. Um, had some monsters. They had big, sharp, pointy teeth. Yes. And uh, yeah, people died, which is always a classic Doctor Who staple. Yes. So talk to me about our – well, first off, yes. um, any thoughts on the director or writer? Do you have any feelings well, about either one? Well, Ed Heim, you know, like I said, he wrote um, It Takes You Away from, from last season, which I thought was a rather innovative episode. 
Um, you know, it was set in Norway and, you know, it had, you know, it was kind of set out in the woods and, um, you know, and it, it kind of introduced, you know, the, you know, the whole mirror world thing. And so I thought that was at least, you know, an attempt to be, you know, very original. And so when I heard that Ed Heim was going to be writing again for series 12, I was pretty excited. I'm like, you know, Hey, I thought that guy turned out one of the more innovative scripts from last season. Um, so I was looking forward to it. Unfortunately, I think, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get too deep in the woods here, but I just don't think this second effort really reached that level of his first script. Okay. And uh, Lee Haven Jones, I we talked about this last time, um, that I thought the direction was a little um, underwhelming compared to the first part. Um, you did mention that. And so... Maybe that's the case here again. I think, you know, and I think a lot of, of you know, like the, the CGI was a bit dubious, a little dodgy, even for Doctor Who standards, at least, you know, in the modern era. And not so much, obviously, in the classic era. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, the, uh, you know, still it's leaps and bounds ahead of the classic era. I, I get I get that. But, yes. um, but yeah, I just, I, I just. I think there, you know, there, the script kind of seemed to be a little bit all over the place. There seemed to be a little too much um, crammed into this to tell within a forty-five minute, um, uh, you know, limit. And yes. uh, and I think and I think the story suffered as a result. But that's my take. What's your take? Okay. I thought it was fine. Um, I was waiting for people, and I do that with quotation marks mm-hmm. to complain about them being um overly political again yes but um and i'm sure that's one of the reasons why they decided to to do a coordinated hit job on this this reviews of this episode but for as long as there's been speculative fiction there have been stories showing that um the end of the world is coming right uh the original planet of the apes you know, uh, where which we this get this story shocking kind of, which ending. It, this yes. story kind of borrows a bit from. Yes, it does. Yeah. Um, so I don't um, – I, I thought it was – I thought it was a decent episode. I, yeah. I don't think it was great, um, but it no. was good. The Doctor is clever. Um, I like that each of the companions had a little something. So I, I was happy with it, and I'm excited to talk to you about it. Yeah. One, one of the things I think that the – you know, and this is maybe just a generational thing, you know, so my age is showing here probably, um, especially when my voice is shredded thanks to Simba Court. But um, I think that, you know, a lot of younger fans, young, young younger viewers, you know, like you're, you're talking your Gen Zs, um, and maybe some of your younger millennials, um, I think they kind of don't really get the concept of science fiction being based on science. And so, so when something, you know, you know, granted the, the messaging in this is really heavy handed, um, especially at the end. I mean, it, it doesn't really, it has zero subtlety. And, and, and so, so, so as a result, um, I think that it, it, you know, because of the, of, again, the generation, not really you know, uh, taking that into appreciation that science fiction is based on science. And so when something is thrown at you based on science, whether you agree with it or not, it's based on science. There's actual empirical data to prove, that, you know, about, about climate change. And so whether you agree with that science or not, that's up to you. But, um, and I think a lot of people, because of their, their ideology, um, are looking it through that filter and it, 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 I think it's taking away from their potential enjoyment. Yeah, and I think you, if there is a valid criticism of this episode, the heavy-handedness, I think, is is right. legitimate. I, I think you are, um, especially the speech at the end. You know, the doctor kind of like yeah. monologuing in, in kind of, mm-hmm. um, you know, yeah. getting, getting up on the soapbox once again. Yes. So, and while I certainly think there's a place for that, mm-hmm. um, 
it is very I think a show works better where they leave it to a little bit of the audience to figure out, oh, okay, this is what they're saying. Right. Even though the show makes it um, very obvious, you don't need to say it um, over and over again, right? Yes. The better stories, the better stories are, are the kind that really um, approach it from a subtle yes. um, viewpoint. You know, they, they, they don't try to deliberately hammer you over the head with the message. They try to make you come up with that message on your own and come yes. to that conclusion like, oh my God, I didn't realize. Like, you know, if you remember, you know, this is even obviously before my generation, you know, like the old 50s episodes of The Twilight Zone, they would have their little mor- morality um, discussions and themes. And I can only imagine, you know, like obviously with the, you know, the modern Twilight Zone, um, you know, that that some of that I think um, isn't really appreciated, that which is which is why I don't think the modern Twilight Zone is really caught on like the original. Um, is that you know the those but those meta those messages you know they 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 were a little bit more overt back in the day, and but they you know they still made you think. Yes, and, and so you know and so and the better storytelling kind of gets gets you to kind of fire your own brain cylinders. And, 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 you know, kind of like, well, maybe I'm looking at this from, a, or, you know, it, it, to make you stop and think and kind of reevaluate maybe your viewpoint on things, your outlook. And, uh, and uh, unfortunately, I don't think this script really does that. Yeah, I, I agree. And I think, I think it's too, we'll get, I think it's a little too busy soapboxing personally. Yeah. And I think we'll, we'll get into this a little bit more, but yeah. absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And like mm-hmm. I said, I, I enjoyed this episode. Yeah. But um, you know, I just th- I think the execution could have been better, in my opinion. All right, yes. so uh, before we get into our discussion, uh, just re- gonna really quickly run down the the guest cast in this one. Uh, just a couple of no- names of note, but uh, Laura Fraser, who plays Kane, who's essentially the Ellen Ripley wannabe, in, in a very aliens like way in this episode. Um, she's notable to Neil Gaiman fans. She played the character Dor in the miniseries adaptation of Neverwhere. And she was delightful in that. I really mm-hmm. enjoyed her as Dor in, in that. If you haven't seen the, uh, the, the BBC miniseries adaptation of Neil Gaiman's Neverwhere, uh, please check it out. It's a very cool little miniseries. Lots of cool uh, character actors. Some you know, some you don't know. And, um, you know, just it's a very excellent production, in my opinion. Um, she was also in the movie A Knight's Tale. And if you're a fan of the AMC series Breaking Bad or Better Call Saul, you know her as Lydia, one of the bigger bads of uh, the later seasons on, on Breaking Bad. Oh yes, that I she absolutely is. I yes, had, did yes. not catch that. Yeah, but she is. Yes, very nice. Yeah, yeah one of the uh, you know that uh, one of the people that Heisenberg has to kind of checkmate. Yes, indeed. Yeah. So, um, so uh, yeah, just uh, so I just thought I'd mention her, um, Lou and Lloyd, who played young Silas in this episode. If you're a fan of the HBO series His Dark Materials, which has been on recently, was an excellent production as well, in my opinion. Uh, you know him from playing Roger, Lara's um, kind of um, sidekick, her, her young boy sidekick that uh, she ends up um, being, you know, driven to rescue from evil forces and of the Magisterium. So. Um, so, uh, but so he's, he's actually a very, he's, he's a pretty impressive little child actor. And I thought he did a really good job here as, uh, Silas, the, uh, mechanic who's better than his dad at being a mechanic. Absolutely. Thought he did a good job. Uh, James Buckley, uh, kind of a British comedian played Nevy, uh, Gia Ray played Bella, Amy Booth Steele played hyphen. And that's, you know, not an, E N in hyphen, it's a three N. So it's H Y P H three N. 
spelled hyphen. And uh, Julia Foster played Vilma, and Carl Farrell, I wonder if there's any relation to Colin Farrell, played Benny. Poor Benny, who uh, goes off with only armed with only his oxygen tank and gets horribly, horribly killed as a result. So, um, so let's get into our main topics, shall we? All right. Have we have we moved away from um, uh, the um, song titles, or do you have a theme this time? I don't have a theme this time. Okay. I've, I've been I've been a little busy this week. I've been yes, doing, you have been. I did, I did three days of training for my real life work thing in Cleveland this week, so I'm kind of scrambling. Uh, so bear with me. And uh, I'm kind of slacking a little bit. So, yeah, just give me kind of, you know, just kind of um, look the other way if it's, you know. Yeah, you're forgiven. You're forgiven. No problem. Just just cut me a little slack here. That's all I'm asking. Um, So topic number one, let's talk about um, the Doctor, Graham, and Yaz. And then um, we can also throw in, because, you know, there's a lot of of the, the miscellaneous characters. There's not really enough for them to get their own topic. Okay. So let's talk. We can talk about any of those characters. I do want to save Ryan, Bella, and Kane for topic number two, and I want to save okay. the dregs for topic number three. Got it. So, 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 uh, Jesse, let, you know, just let's start off. What did you What did you make of of Graham? We the, the premise of this one is that Graham kind of gets a hold of some space coupons, you know, coupons from space. Mm-hmm. And ends up sending the TARDIS team on an all-inclusive luxury vacation, whether they want to go or not, to Tranquility Spa. So, Graham, Graham, you have the ultimate spaceship time machine. Yes. That you could go vacation anywhere you want to go. Right. You do not have to win a contest. Yes. However, I get that. He just got carried you know, away, you know. He did get carried away. It's it's the same thing that why when we we're at Costco or Sam's, we're like, oh, look, if we buy this, we get this for free. Right. You know? And it's like. Um, my, so mom, I, my mom loves to do that, by the way. She is all about the buy one, get one free. Yes. At, at, at supermarkets or whatnot. So She's um, all about the BOGO. My, I first, I, th- I thought of that and smiled. Yeah. I also love his idea of a vacation is I'm going to go sit on that chair. Right. Then after a few hours, I'm going to go sit in that chair and then I'm going to have a con a, co- a cocktail. cocktail. Yeah. Um, it kind of the know, old man vacation. So Graham's yes, kind of shown his, shown his age there a little bit. So I am raising my hand. I am the old man. Yes. Linda, when she goes on vacation, she wants to go, you know, right. hiking and exploring and sightseeing. And you're just I like, leave be, me at the hotel. I'm, yes, I am fine just sitting and and because, you know, I love being in a pretty spot overlooking either the beach or the pool or even a lovely lobby in the hotel and just with my Kindle or my hard pack book. And I'm just fine. Just, you don't, you don't don't have that, that sense of adventure and no, I need to go out there and explore. No, I don't need that. Okay. Um, So so you're, so you're definitely in the Graham category. I am in the Graham category. You're a team Graham on this one. Yes. Um, so I thought that was a really funny. Yes. Um, the all of them exploring off when they get there. Well, yeah, yeah like you they, know, they yeah. all kind of split off. You know, like yeah, like Yaz goes off, and then Ryan and Graham they they just go do their thing, and then the Doctor is kind of left behind, going like, well, I get so I guess I'll just look around, shall I? Okay, and and of course thought, you know. You know, it's the doctor, so of course, you know, she's a, tr- a, a trouble magnet. When they're cleaning up, yes, and the doctor, um, I don't know if that's, I, I did not get a chance to write too many quotes, but I didn't you know, either, like, so. I, I didn't know there was a mating, I didn't know they were in mating season or whatever, yes, you're right? And so they're all mopping up and such. Um, and they talk about the vacation and they they make a comment about, and maybe it'll get the doctor out of her mood. 
and this is you and I have both been married for a long time, right? right it's right, like, right. oh, we're you're gonna and and be to be fair, our spouses would say the same thing about us. Yes. Well, you know, Jesse should cheer up. I, I'm not in a bad mood, you know, and that's the doctor's like, I'm not in a mood, right. but you can tell she is this. The with and here's where they were subtle. The consequences of Gallifrey right. is still weighing on her, now, and she played that well, right, by showing that. Um, and so they're going, um, maybe we'll cheer her up, feel in a better mood. And she's like, no, no, I'm not in a bad place. Well, maybe that's kind of why Graham was so eager to go for that luxury vacation because, um, it, I I kind of know about you, but I kind of got the vibe that we had. There had been kind of like a few adventures off camera that we hadn't seen. Yes, I, the, I totally and, agree. With and that. apparently, the doctor is still being mopey. Yes, and, and I think so, mopey so, so, so maybe is the, the perfect world. Not to speak over you. No, go that ahead. Is the perfect word, Charles. That's it. She is not moody. She's mopey, and they are worried about her. Yeah, and so maybe that's why Graham is just like, "Oh, hey, this will cheer her up, and let's go do this." And uh, I was a little thrown at first because, you know, the Graham had that kind of glowing cube. And I don't know about you, but I immediately thought of like, well, is that the cube from the doctor's wife? You know, that, you know, like it did that, look a little bit that we, like that. that we also saw classic fans we saw in the war games, that kind of telepathic Time Lord cube. But no, it had absolutely no relation to it. But I did think of it because I saw that I, I, I had seen one of the still pictures uh, leading up to this episode. And I was like. Ooh, or, you know, it's like, is is does the doctor is the doctor getting mail? And uh, unfortunately, that wasn't the case because I think that would have been a much better episode than we got. One of the things I like about this new series, yes, and this new doctor is the sense of in family. I guess she calls it her fam, but yes, the I, they are all the four of them are friends. You know, he talks about Ryan says, I'm with my mates. Yes. You know, they are truly um, there is a strong bond. There is a friendship and they like spending time together. Right. The four of them isn't just I want to go travel exciting places like Donna wanted to see the the world and the universe. You know, I think these four just like spending time together. And I really like that in the when, companion, the doctor's relationship. Right. I mean, it, yeah. it, it, it kind of makes sense is like if you're traveling with some somebody, especially for an extended length of time, uh, it kind of helps that you get along. And yeah. You, and that you kind of look out for each other, especially when you're doing something as dangerous as what the doctor does, you know, traveling, you know, like traveling, you know, who knows where, no pun intended, and facing all these things, these alien threats, like, you know, one week it's the Daleks, the next week it's the Cybermen or whatever, and, um, you know, almost getting killed on a regular basis so you kind of have to have these – it would kind of help things along uh, if you actually enjoyed the people you were um, surviving all these horrific adventures with. And so um, I, I, I kind of want to see an episode – We and we've, we've talked about this – where there needs to be some form of support group because yes. after going through all these adventures, you would think that would take a toll on – almost getting killed on a regular basis. Uh, absolutely. Um, the I'm thinking of, and this is a slight veer to the Phantom Zone mm -hmm. where we talked to Watchmen, but they had that post-traumatic circle, you know, yes, their yes. version of the, uh, it's it's not an AA meeting, but it is a you know that kind of yeah, like yeah, dimensional yeah. event is support group yeah, kind of thing yeah yeah, yeah which and is, so which is a squid and so you could see ex companions right um, I I'm sure it's out there in fan fiction somewhere um, so but it would be that would, would be a I would, fun episode. I would love to write that episode yes, I would I, I would have a, I would have a ball with that yes absolutely uh, but um, now I'd love to, to be able to talk yes in this episode. But uh, once again, 
Yaz gets sidelined. She doesn't have much to do. I loved mm. the um, her interrupting uh, Benny when he's yeah. going to pop the question on this. They've lived together for years. Right. Um, no, yeah, she does not have a lot to do this episode. No, she's, you know, like here's poor Benny. Uh, he's like, okay, I got the idyllic spot, and I'm gonna you know, like this is the moment I'm gonna pop the question, and then wah wah, along comes Yaz to ruin it. Yes. And um, now, granted, she didn't know. She no, just kind of so it's not like she intentionally did it, but um, yes. And then the only thing they really seem to give her is her kind of teasing Ryan. Uh, as he attempts to flirt really badly with Bella. So, yes. uh, so again, they seem to be, I don't know about you, but I, they seem to be trying to hint at a possible flirtation between Ryan and Yaz. But, uh, but you know, it's, it's still in the very early stages, I think. And, and I'm okay with that. I, I think that, are you 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 yeah, you, you like I, the idea? Or are you I would, the idea? I would ship them being um, a companion together. You know, right, right. Um, them being a couple would I would be okay with that. Yeah. Um. I, but I also um, because I've liked them hanging out together since uh, Rosa. Yes. Where that where they were kind of like you know there's that moment where, um, you know they're that Yaz is kind of consoling Ryan. About, you know, like, hey, you know, um, things do get better, obviously, you know, mm-hmm. in, in, in then, you know, the 50s. Right. And, and, you know, it's still a long way to go. But, you know, like she she can relate because she's had her experiences with racism as well. And that, and I really like the, that bonding they had there. I do, too. And I'd like to see more of that. Yes, I agree. So yes. uh, and if nothing else, it would give Yaz more something to do, at least to, you know, to kind of have those character moments. And I, and, and I think that would be a little, I mean, they tried to do that with Ryan here and we'll talk about Ryan, of course, but well, I want to keep that as his own sec- separate segment a little bit. But one of the things that I enjoyed, Roy was a nurse, Roy yes. was a nurse and that they, they used that often. Um, one of the reasons I liked Martha as a yeah. companion is she was a doctor and they used that. Um, Yaz is a police officer. Yes. That means she should be, um, brave, maybe a little bit of a detective because right. that's where she wants to do. Inquisitive. And, yeah. Yeah. Inquisitive. They don't show that a lot. And I think that is to their detriment. They should. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you you have a character, with, I think, with a lot of potential. I agree. Yeah. But, uh, you know, you got to do something with that, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, and and it's not just like, well, you got to have something for Yaz to do. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it should kind of flow naturally out of the story. I do and, think that. And that's why um, I kind of think, you know, like Spyfall Part One mm-hmm. really did that well. Everybody yes. had something to do in that episode. So we talked about things that we're going to – isn't worth a whole segment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so let's talk about some of the other yeah. characters. Yeah, the – You want to talk about Hyphen, any? You know, the, uh, the kind you know, of re- – There wasn't the re- much to say about that. The, re- the refugee from uh, yeah. the Cats movie. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> but the whole um, Nevi. Yeah, Nevi. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, you know – why wouldn't you yeah, let's talk about those two for a little bit yeah one of the things that i loved reading years ago right is they asked kirk douglas if he was jealous of his son michael winning an oscar when he had never won one right and kirk douglas said he's my son if he wins an Oscar, I win an Oscar. It is, it is just, you know, that he's, is. He's proud I, of his son, yes. I'm proud of that. In, in his way, that is rewarding his son is the same as honoring him. Right. So why would you be, I, I just think that was bad written, poorly written, that the father would n- would not acknowledge that his son's better than him. And I guess yeah. it gave you a slight character arc, but I, I don't think 
I don't think it was a very good character arc. No, it's something and, it, does, it didn't yeah. make him like likable or sympathetic. No, it just kind of made him selfish. I think a little bit like, yes. like you know, oh hey, I'm the adult, so therefore yes. I know what I'm talking about. You have no idea what you're talking about, right? And and not really appreciating that. Now sometimes fathers have problems with that. Yeah, they do, and and, and I and I'm not saying that because isn't... my dad, my dad used to kind of take. Um, you know, there'd be a lot of times where he would like show, try to show me th how to do something and I would know how to do it, Yes. but, but he would step in and still mm -hmm. want to do it himself. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, look, just give it to me. I'll do it. Yeah. So, um, so there's a little bit of that and I get that, but, um, I think that, um, instead of being forced to recognize that his son has talent, Yes. I think he should have realized that on his own. Absolutely. And uh, it would have made him, I think, a much more sympathetic character. I agree. Yeah. Um, and the Silas, I thought, was great. Yes. Um, you know, he, he, it's, it's funny because, you know, like, as, far, as much as Nevi was a kind of a horrible character, Silas is a character I would like to see again. You know, just, just show up out of nowhere. Hey, there's this kid mechanic who's like a super genius. Mm -hmm. Let's see some. Let's see. I'm all for bringing Silas back. Yeah, I, just, I, I just like leave, that too. Just leave Dad at home. I think. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, any other characters you want to talk about? I um, can't think of anything yeah. else that stands out. Is there anything you? I don't think so. I think. I think. Okay. We, I think we can move on. All right. So okay. let's move on. Topic number two. So here's where we can talk about Ryan and Bella. Yes. And because it, Bella's in this segment, I would let's all let's also throw in Kane. Okay. Because we get a big revelation that, hey, these two are related. And yes. apparently Bella has some serious mommy issues. Big, big. Um... So what do you want to talk about first? You want to talk about Ryan and Bella flirting rather, yeah, so rather horribly? The... Or do you yes. want to talk about? All right. So I kind of like that. She's like, oh, I'm not trying to hit you up. And um, she's like, oh, shame. You know, and he yeah. kind of smiles. So I thought that was kind of nice. And um, them both sucking their thumb because they've been hit by that virus, uh, which was funny. Right. The whole I like know, that. I like that, the, I like that at the beginning that they're both yeah. kind of sitting there. Yes. But then that whole bit at the end when there's she's trying to say goodbye. Yes. And she does like she sucks her thumb. And then for whatever reason, Ryan decides to suck his thumb again mm -hmm. as a kind of sympathetic gesture. But I'm thinking, why are you doing that? <laughs> well, because that's how they bonded. Together. I know, that but it just, bother me. It, it just seemed it a little didn't... silly to me. Yeah. Um, I, I think this was really bad logic. Yeah. I – this place has taken my mom away from me, so therefore I'm going to blow this place up. Yeah. What? That's just, <laughs> yeah. The, you know, there's a phrase, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, this is, you know, yeah. let's throw the resort, you know, hey, let's make it so you can never spend time with your right. mom. Like, uh, mom just mom missed my sense. birthdays, therefore uh, this place has got to go sky high. Yeah. I'm going to burn, I'm going to burn this mother effer down. And and it just didn't make any sense. Um, it's like um, maybe mm -hmm. you could talk to somebody about that. Maybe yes. you know, um got some issues. And then they kind of leave Bella. I mean, this episode ends, and it's kind of one of the frustrating things for me. The doctor and the fam get whisked back to the TARDIS. Yes. And Bella apparently is going to work out her issues with her mom, fighting being surrounded by the dregs. And that's where we leave them. It just... It, it kind of fell flat a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, I, I definitely think so. There's no sense of real closure there. They're just like, okay, I guess they get eaten because they get overwhelmed. Yeah. But um, it just, yeah, I don't know. See, yeah, I, I didn't like it at all. Yeah, I mean, because, yeah. you know, like, Kane wasn't very sympathetic at all as a character. Right. Um, Bella was only sympathetic when she was flirting with Ryan. 
And then when she gets revealed as like, oh, hey, you know, you know that virus that both of us had? Well, I'm the one who brought it here. Because I was trying to take down my mom's, um, you know, company. And because I'm pissed at my mom. And so um, it just seems a little silly that, okay, yeah, she she gave herself her own, um, uh, dis, you know, like kind of um, virus. Yeah, I, I didn't like that storyline at all. Um, and it could have been a good storyline. Right. I think that having someone, um, you know, having this attraction right. and doing that could have been – something interesting mm -hmm. but um I, I just didn't like this at all now i did like ryan though yes. because because ryan you know as we kind of gather it's it's kind of funny because ryan you know up to this point has kind of been shown as this really uncoordinated because of his illness uh, yes. his condition i should say mm -hmm. um you know that he can't ride a bike properly he can't shoot a basketball properly so he's already a little bit awkward Especially yeah. for like a really good looking good dude and mm -hmm. um, who should be like, you know, a natural with the ladies. Yes. And but he's so horribly socially awkward. And so you have this like you know, really handsome guy and he's rubbish at talking to women. Yes. And, and we get we get that here. I kind of I mean, I, it, it makes him, I think, a little bit more sympathetic um, yes. you know, that he's just, not just some, some guy with a really thick accent, um, you know, and, you know, it makes him, it gives him some characterization. So I kind of like that. And, um, I thought it was, I thought it was very funny to see him, uh, contracting that virus from the vending machine. And then the whole, the whole rigmarole that goes on with the, with the doctor trying to show him how to, you know, deal with that virus and, and, the whole, you know, telling him to, you know, to suck his thumb and whatnot to wore off the hallucinations, and then he starts having these hallucinations and freaking out. So that was a fun moment. I like that, and I want to yeah, see I more of that. Lot. So, so I want to give credit to Tosin Cole there. At least, you know that, uh, you know, at least they, at least they, we kind of got a little bit of characterization in, as far as Ryan. Yes. Um, it was, and and I like the attraction. I like the something something that didn't directly involve Graham for once, too. Yes, yeah. Um, I did like the scene where all the they show all the people dying and the yeah. red dots, and he's worried. You know, Graham is worried about Ryan. Right. Uh, I I like that um, that family sense. That was good. Um, I also like when the crisis stopped. Yes. And where uh, Bella goes, what happened? Well, if I had to guess, it's the doctor. You yes. Know, just like this, I, I, that was like, yep. Yeah. That's exactly what happened. And exactly. you know that because you've been traveling with her. That exactly. was a good line. Exactly. Yeah, I like that yes. a lot too. All mm -hmm. right. Uh, anything else about these three characters? Can't think of anything else. All right. Nope. All right. Topic number three. Final yes. topic. Final topic this week. Let's talk about the dregs. Yes. Um, obviously, they're our monster of the week. Um, we find out through the course of the episode, oh, hey, the dregs are us because global warming or climate yes. change. Take your pick. And uh, that apparently, you know, the uh, this is a what we're told is it's a possible future. Yes. Which one kind of made me wonder why. Why is it a possible future? Um, is it just because that way we can kind of explain it? Because we've seen future Earth. And we know that humanity doesn't become these creatures. Right. So we have to kind of like to justify the story. We have to come up with the fact that the doctor isn't just traveling through time. The doctor is crossing potential timelines. Yes. For whatever reason. Yeah, um, this is... And we don't really get an explanation about why she's suddenly crossing alternate timelines. And the idea is, um, you know, time can be written, right. except when it can't be rewritten. Um, and uh, so I, 
I was okay with that. I, I think, as you said, yeah. it was a little too heavy handed. on the nose. Yeah. Right. You know? Um, so did you see that coming, the whole revelation that, oh, you know, Orphan 55 is Earth or a Earth? Um, possible Earth. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I wasn't shocked. Right. But it also didn't sit there going, oh, my goodness, yeah, yeah. Um, you know. Yeah, you almost um, like you, you brought up Planet of the Apes earlier. And yes. you almost kind of like when they found that 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 section of uh, of underground tunnels. Yes. You almost expected Charlton Houston come out like, damn you, you did it. Yes. You actually did it. Did, you, yes. Damn you all to hell. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, we didn't get that. So. But obviously, yeah. because hey, Charlton Heston's old and dead, so yes, yes, yes. He's no longer with no us. longer with us, but yes. uh, but still, um, yeah. it, but it did feel a bit bit Planet of the Apes a little bit. Yeah, um, I thought they were good villains. I thought they looked creepy. Right. I thought they the special effects were well done. Yeah, um, it's a um, you know I thought it was an interesting the idea they are basically. Um, living plants as in they take in carbon dioxide and give out oxygen. Right. Um, I thought the plan of, well, we're going to terraform this, um, this orphan planet and, and we're going to actually have tourists pay for it. Right. Um, wasn't necessarily a bad plan, you know, um, we've, we've seen worse. Yeah. But, but and we, we find out that essentially what they're called is fakeations. Yes. That, you know, that, that it, you know, these people are brought to kind of like these kind of uh, holographic um, yeah. environments, like, you know, just ho- almost like, like a holodeck resort almost. Yes. Mm-hmm. And, you know, not really taking into account the, uh, the, uh, what it, what the building really looks like, but they just, just the idea of it. And if there wasn't the, if it wasn't for, those pesky kids, no. Yes, if it yeah. wasn't for the old man Johnson, yeah. The, the, if it wasn't for the creatures, this actually would be a good plan. Yes, right. That while they're doing that, they could, um, you know, they could be there and they could work on this. Um, but um, unfortunately, we did have the creatures. Right. Um, this is a basic monster attacking, kills a lot of people. Post-apocalyptic. The, yeah, the doctor yeah. figures it out. Right. And we get, um, you know, a couple of survivors, but mostly, um, you know, we have a lot of red shirts on this episode as I mix genres or mix right. shows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, you know, like, again, it's, there's a very classic Who thing to kill off most of your cast, supporting cast yes. in the episode. Yeah. And... Um, this is obviously no different here. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I was okay with that. I was okay with yeah. the high, I'm okay with a high body count on Dr. Who. I've yeah, watched uh, enough Dr. Who to, to become pretty numb to that. Sadly, I guess there were sometimes the cast you lose um, makes me sadder. This yes. time this did not make me sad. Right. Um, you know, in the past I've been really unhappy, like, Oh no, I didn't want to lose this person. Uh, but yeah, it was good. I mean, I thought it was a fine episode. Yeah. I, I don't, I, as we talked about at the very beginning, um, I think it, that people are being a little harsh on it. Yeah. I, um, do too. I think this is a perfectly acceptable yeah. doctor who episode. Yeah. I think, I mean, I think I'd, I'd say it's an average doctor who episode, Yes. Nothing, nothing remarkable, right? And and, and that's going to probably reflect in my rating. But I don't re- think it was horrible. No, I certainly I don't agree. think anything in the in the love and monsters level. No, and according to one, um, one column I read, you know, yeah. I was doing a little search. Right. I guess this is on some rating. This is the lowest episode except for love and monsters. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, that's that's kind of hard. See, I I would put sleep no more much lower than this yeah um sleep no more and you know it's probably you know like there's love and monsters sleep no more you know there's two of my least favorite episodes of the modern era mm-hmm. and or, or maybe all of doctor who uh, which mm-hmm. says a lot because that's a lot, obviously a lot of doctor who a lot of doctor who yes. but uh yeah just i don't think this is anywhere near that level i think a lot of people because they're just wanting to hate on series 12 are just overreacting 
Yeah, I think that a lot of they're people going, they just want to go see. See, I told you it's going to suck. Yeah, and it's like, well, it's just not a great episode. Doctor Who has yeah. those. Yeah, exactly. And, ho- and hopefully we'll get something better next week. So yeah, right. absolutely. Anything else about this episode? No, can't think of anything. I'm trying not to be really hard on it. Uh, no, 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 and I, I don't think you have been because Captain Grumpy is your your shtick, not mine. So. Yeah, no, I think it's good. All right, I try yeah. to be, I try to be the optimistic one. You are. I try. Yes. And even when you I de- are you are a ray of sunshine. Even when I don't like something, I'm trying to be optimistic about it. All right. Absolutely. All right. So, uh, favorite quotes. So I only have one. Okay, go for it. Um, but um, I think it's a great one. Uh, when the doctor said. If I had crayons and half a canvas span, I could build you from scratch. Now get out of my way. That's I awesome. love when I forgot about the, that quote. That was yeah. Awesome I quote. love when the doctor is cocky. Yeah. Well, mm-hmm. in in that same vein, I have one pretty much like along those lines. Okay. So the doctor is talking about having a plan. Okay. And she goes, "Oh, it's brewing. At least three eighths of a plan right here. Two eighths." Which of course is one fourth. Yeah, I'll be I'll be honest. All I've got is the letter P, but sometimes that's all I need. Yes, I I love that. I yeah. you know it's... That's a, that, and that is a, a definitive doctor quote right there. So that you know, like you know, all I all I've got is the letter P, but sometimes that's all I need. That should be like on a motivational, um, you know, like a motivational poster with a cat hanging on it. That uh, yeah. you know, like. Like, uh, you know, like I've got a plan sometimes, you know, like all I've got is the letter P, but sometimes that's all I need. Yeah. It kind of like also, um, was it, I, I don't think it was last episode is it yeah. was before that where she's like, um, they're safe. Well, they're relatively safe. Yeah. They're three quarters safe. Well, you know, yeah. that kind of, I, I love when this she's, doctor, she kind of does her own little progress, progress yes. bar in her head. Yes, she does, and yeah. I and I love that about her. Yeah, good. You got um, any more? Yeah, I got a, a, I got a few more. So, okay. um, one of the, you know, the doctor, the thirteenth doctor, got to um, reset a classic Patrick Troughton era line, which has ah, been which is kind of which has kind of been recycled over various doctors. Uh, Peter Davison's doctor, the fifth doctor, liked to use this. Um, I think uh, you know it's been other doctors, of course, throughout the years. Uh, where she says, "When I say run, run." Nice. So that was it. That was a very. That was something that uh, Patrick Troughton's second Doctor started back in the day. Um, you know, when he he would go like, "When I say run, run." And good. Good. So yeah. So I like that. As I like that little nod to the past. Uh, the Doctor also saying, uh, "The people who used to have this planet could have changed, but they didn't. So they lost everything." Be smarter than what made you. Yeah. And then, of course, that big in-your-face speech where she says, look, I know what you're thinking, but it's one possible future. It's one timeline. You want me to tell you that Earth is going to be okay? Because I can't. In your time, humanity is already is busy arguing over the washing up while the house burns down. Unless fa- people face facts and change, Catastrophe is coming, but it's not decided. You know that. The future is not fixed. It depends on millions of decisions and actions and people stepping up. Humans, I think you, I think you forget how powerful you are. Lives change worlds. People can save planets or wreck them. That's the choice. Be the best of humanity. Nice. So by and large, that's not a horrible statement. No, no, it isn't. But uh, but I think it was just the way it kind of delivered in, in, in almost like you almost expected the doctor to be looking straight at the camera. Yeah, that, exactly. That it came off just the, I think it was the way it was delivered, in my opinion. And again, I, I'm going to fault the director on that one, I think. Yeah. It's all right. Uh, rating. What's your rating for this one? So I didn't hate it. Yes. But that boy – Damning a, with faint praise. Yeah, right? I was gonna say that there's a ringing endorsement. I didn't yeah, hate it. Um, yeah, I, I'm yeah. gonna give it seven out of ten gram speedos. Just oh, kidding. Yeah. yeah, that's a frightening thought, isn't it? Gram yes, speedos. it was. Yeah. Yes. Um, we are in sync, believe it ah, or not. So okay. see, I wasn't horrible about no, it. No, you weren't. No. I think I think it's a perfectly average episode. I mean, granted, yeah. that's kind of like a C minus, but still. Right. 
Uh, not D or an F, at least. No, no, no. So I'm going to give it seven vending machines infected with hopper viruses. I love that. Nice. That was good. So uh, I kind of like. I like the fact. I like the idea of the vending machine giving you uh, disease. That was pretty yes. funny. All right. Um, and and then of course, Toast and Cole as Ryan was pretty funny in that sequence. Yes. I thought I really enjoyed that. All right. So. With this in mind, so Orphan 55, you watch this, you're like, oh, I'm kind of in the mood for something along those lines. Ooh, share. So what do I recommend? So Please. we're going to reverse the polarity of the neutron flow back to 1986 with The Mysterious Planet. Ooh. This was the first serial from the Trial of a Time Lord season, uh, season 23, Colin Baker's final season. Sadly, as the Sixth Doctor, uh, written by Robert Holmes, uh, one of the f- his last couple of episodes for Doctor Who ever before he passed away. Mm-hmm. And um, so, events of this serial are are kind of like starting off on this arcing plot that carries through the rest of season twenty three. Of course, we had the Sixth Doctor being put on trial for conduct unbecoming a Time Lord. Um, they're threatening impeachment. And so the Veliar presents video. Impeachment? F- I know. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. Okay. Sorry. It was a, it was a joke. They didn't threaten them. They threatened okay. him, you know, with the, you know, uh, losing the remaining lives but of uh-huh. his regenerations. But uh, the Valiar presents video footage taken from the Matrix of the Doctor's recent involvement on the planet Ravalox. Where, oh, okay. Where the Valiar shows that the Doctor willingly became involved in the affairs of the peop- of the planet there. So the Doctor and Perry, his companion Perry, land on Ravelox, which was devastated by a fireball, according Ooh. to official records, but the presence of flourishing plant life make him suspicious. As they walk, they are observed by Sabalom Glitz, excuse me, Sabalom Glitz and Dibber, who are mercenaries on the planet attempting to destroy a black light generator in order to destroy the L3 robot deep underground that uh, powers it. Okay. So the Doctor and Perry find this tunnel, they go inside, and they find remains that appear to be the Marble Arch tube station on the London Underground Central Line, peaking mm. peaking the Doctor's curiosity further. Perry gets captured by a local human tribe led by a, wo- a woman named Katricia, and brought to the camp, brought to their camp. Katricia locks Perry away with Glitz and Dibber, but the three escape after planting a bomb on the black light generator. The doctor also gets captured by the underground humans under watch by the immortal, which is actually the L3 robot that Glitz is looking for, which calls itself Drathro. Mm, per- okay. per- Perry, Glitz and Dibber eventually meet up with the doctor back of the ruins of the marble arch and Glitz confirms that the black light generator is now severely damaged beyond repair. And if it should self-destruct, oh, it could take the entire universe with it. No big deal. Uh, the doctor pleads Drathro to shut himself down in order to disable the black light system. But Drath- Drathro's like, uh-uh, Drathro don't play that. Uh, Glitz offers to take Drathro aboard his ship, uh, which has a functioning black light system. And Drathro's like, okay, I'm down with that and agrees. Uh, the doctor finds the black light system is already beginning to self-destruct and reconfigures the system so that its explosion is limited to the underground complex. Mm. The, re- the remains of the tribe offer to take in those humans that were living underground. And as the doctor and Perry say their goodbyes, uh, the doctor wonders how earth traveled so far from its solar system and became Ravelox. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, dun, dun, dun. Okay. And, that, and that's obviously something that revealed later in the trial of the Time Lord season. Oh, but, nice. But so we had the Earth being devastated. And there's like, we find out that it's the Earth because, hey, there's some like underground uh, tunnels that mm-hmm. are from these, you know, like railway stations. Okay. So sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? To Orphan yes, 55? it does. Yeah, I like it. Yep. So if you're in the mood, if you kind of were kind of digging the Orphan 55 vibe, uh, go back and check The Mysterious Planet. Good, good. Might be Very right nice. Around. All right. So uh, listener feedback. So we have three emails this week. 
Ah, okay. One from someone very new to Next Stop Everywhere. Ah, very so, nice. So uh, welcome to our uh, cadre of listeners, Adrienne from Wisconsin. Oh, ah, okay. Now I have to wonder if she knows Holly from Wisconsin, but you know, it's kind of a big state, so maybe they don't know each other, but mm -hmm. um, but it'd be kind of cool if they did. So, so now I'm kind of curious if they know each other. So Adrienne writes in. Uh, regarding Spyfall Part 2. Nice. So, uh, Adrienne, welcome to Next Stop Everywhere. Thank you so much for writing in, and uh, and uh, glad you're listening. So she goes, hello, Charles and Jesse. Hello, Adrienne. Uh, I discovered your podcast recently. Yay. Yay. And, and have started listening from Episode 1. Wow. wow. That's well the, done. All the way back to uh, to our first uh, episode, an unearthly podcast. We need to send her a virtual sticker or something. Yes. Uh, or, yeah, or, the little, you know, a blue ribbon. Well yeah. done. Or maybe a, like a sympathetic bouquet of flowers. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so that's awesome. Uh, I know you've already covered Spyfall Part 2, but didn't hear you discuss your theories on how the master destroyed Gallifrey. So I thought I'd share you uh, my theory. Um, I think the master found the moment and used it. Mm -hmm. That's interesting theory. And yes. of, course, of course, in the day of the doctor, Moffat didn't tie the loose end of the moment being left in the barn when the three doctors left in their TARDISes to save Gallifrey. That's a good observation, Adrian. Yeah, very good. Yes. Uh, so points to you. I'm going to mark one up there. Yep. Points to Adrian yep, on that one. Very nice. Uh, none of them took it with them to put in a safe location or said anything hinting that they went back to deal with it because, well, that's loose ends. The doctor is horrible at loose ends, in case you hadn't noticed, yes. right? Uh, I think Chibnall used that loose end to undo everything Moffat did in the day of the doctor. Interesting. Mm, okay. That's a good theory. Um, I it hope is that, a good theory. Uh, and we're out to watch and stay tuned. So I hope the doctor will be able to save Gallifrey again. But what the master did may have lasting effects like the events on DC's Crisis on Infinite Earths. Nice. 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 Well done. I hope you're checking out the Phantom Zone podcast now that absolutely because uh, we've been talking crisis. We're going to talk more crisis. So absolutely. But uh, she goes, love the podcast. Keep up the good work. Adrian from Wisconsin. Good. You want me to read Holly Mac? Yeah, please do. But uh, yeah, I just want to say again, thank you, Adrian, for checking out oh, our podcast. Absolutely. We really, we always love hearing from new people. Um, we're glad you are so glad you're listening, and thanks for checking us out because we know there's other Doctor Who podcasts out there. Um, so it really means a lot that you check us out, and uh, glad you're enjoying it. Absolutely. Please keep us keep and the keep, feedback coming in and, and keep writing. We'd love to hear keep, it. Yes, absolutely. All right. So yeah, go ahead and read Holly if you would. All right. Uh, to the hey, other side, the, the other side of yeah. Wisconsin. Yes. Yeah. Hey, Charles and Jesse, that's us. Yay. An interesting episode. Was I the only one thinking the cards that Graham put together look like the Time Lord message cubes? Nope. Ding, ding, ding. Nope. No, you were not. No, you were not. Yaz interrupting the romantic moment between Velma and Benny had me shaking my head. Fake Cation is one way of putting it. At least the spa wasn't called something with California in its name. Nice. Little hint of midnight in the vehicle leading them away from the Tranquility Spa. Kane and Vorm were interesting characters. They really didn't or couldn't tell the Doctor about the truth about where they were heading and the planet itself. The reveal about what Planet Orphan 55 is, I didn't see coming. All in all, a decent episode. Looking forward to next week episode. I'll wrap it up here. Holly from Wisconsin. Yay. Holly, we always love hearing from you. Thank you so much. As always, your insight is greatly appreciated. Definitely, and definitely. And uh, we definitely appreciate that. So mm -hmm. I always love hearing from you. So, so there you go. We got two people from Wisconsin represented here on the podcast. So, uh, all you other states, you better step up. Yeah. Just, just saying. Wisconsin's, uh, you know, got theirs in. So um, lastly, we hear from David K. Proctor writing in once again. He's on a roll lately. Uh, so hi, David. Uh, writing in, of course, about Orphan 55. He says, this is a very good episode. He, t he told a story, and I think he's referring to Ed Heim here. 
that not only edu- entertainment, let's see, let's see. He told a story that is not only entertainment, but educated. How's that? Okay. Um, all right. So I had to kind of translate that a little bit. Uh, there's a lot to say about the episode itself. Uh, nobody stood out as a bad performance and the performances were consistent and nobody particularly excelled. Uh, I am glad to see they stepped out of the trope where crew members automatically fall in love with one another. Uh, it is also good that they show emotions outside of day-to-day excitement for the trip. These companions, or fam, if you will, have been on the TARDIS long enough now that they are starting to become accustomed to it. So them starting to be like regular humans and talking up the locals is exactly what humans would do. I think this is a good place-holding episode with a very powerful message. I gave it eight and a half holes in the wall. Nice. Very nice. And uh, so he really liked it. Uh, Mm -hmm. Keep up the good work. Look forward to hearing from you next week. Thanks, David K. Proctor. Well, thank you, David. We so appreciate that. Definitely. Um, It is very nice. I'm glad glad you enjoyed it more than we did. Yeah, me too. I, you know, Because that's good. I want I want I want people to enjoy Doctor Who. Crazily enough, it's it's yeah, weird. I'm weird like I, that. I never, uh, you know, we we're happy when someone enjoys the episode. Yes, we never sit there and go, "What?" Yeah, you know, um, like, like we're yeah. not going to we're not going to call you crazy or attack no. you because yeah. you liked a Doctor Who episode. Yeah, that's awesome. That, that, Absolutely, that makes no sense to me. So you're mad at someone for liking. The show you're supposed to be liking. Yeah, it, I am right there with you. It makes no sense. I don't whatsoever. get. I don't get that at yeah, all. I don't. I would. I would be like, "That's awesome that you liked it better than I did. I just didn't like it as much as you did." Exactly. And, yeah. But maybe that's just me. I guess. Yeah. I don't know. All right. No. But uh, so that's awesome. And uh, hopefully you keep enjoying the episodes. All right. So if you want to be like Adrienne, Holly, Mac, and David. Uh, please write to us at next stop everywhere smg at gmail.com next stop everywhere smg at gmail.com or you can reach out to us on the twitter machine at next stop smg or on facebook next stop everywhere the doctor who podcast or on instagram at next stop everywhere podcast so please check that out jesse how about you well you can hear me talk about comic book shows on television uh right now we are discussing uh we will be discussing the crisis on infinite earths um episodes that just recently showed up Parts on the fan of Zone podcast yeah. yes yep. we're with, uh, charles and i talk about that we've gone over watchmen we've talked about the boys uh just all kinds of stuff coming up yep we um and we are re- we are on hiatus but if you just reason the beautiful thing about uh, on demand is you may just have found the DC Universe um, streaming service and you're checking out the Titans. Uh, we discussed both Titans season one and season two and Doom Patrol, which is in its right. own Earth now. Right, we've established. Yeah, that we, that we, we, we learned that. Yes, I, I yeah. was, we're going to talk about that obviously on the Fan yeah. Zone when we talk about Crisis. But uh, yes, uh, but yeah, so Titans and Doom Patrol are now on separate Earths. I'm not yes. sure how I feel about that. Yeah, Titan Talk. Yes. Um, is that a, a podcast? Titan, yeah, and Titan, then, Titan Talk, the Titans podcast. Yeah, and then Set Listing Bruce, the Bruce Springsteen podcast, where I talk to Bruce Springsteen fans from around the world um, about their love of music uh, and Bruce Springsteen. And we have, um, you know, I, that comes out every week. And coming up this week, I'm recording. I'm going to ask Charles his opinion on if you had. Four people to put on the Mount Rushmore of rock Ooh. and four bands. Yes. What would you pick? So I'm going to give t- Charles some time to talk about that and make him email me later. Uh, you can find can me that. on Twitter at Twitter at Jesse Jackson um, uh, DFW. You can find me on Facebook. Um, just I'm out there. Charles, how about you? Yeah, because I'm a little pissed that Pat Benatar got stiffed by the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah, I went and yes. but Whitney Houston got in. Yeah, now, Whitney Houston's a bigger act, but she's not exactly what I would call rock and roll. Yeah, there we actually had a discussion on the 
but it's a I it's more mentioned. of a it's more of a popularity contest. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I never mentioned the how many podcasts that I do. Yeah. Uh, but we did a discussion. We went through yeah. every year of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame right. class to discuss it. And we had that discussion about it is kind of pop music, yeah. rock and roll, right. rhythm and blues, a kind of big blending. So, but yes, yeah. Pat Benatar should have been. Yeah, no, nothing against anybody that likes Whitney Houston. I just can't yeah. quite compare. I want to dance with somebody with Pat Benatar's Heartbreaker. Yes. And think that Whitney Houston deserves to be in instead of mm-hmm. Pat Benatar. So, yeah. but maybe, you know, hopefully Pat Benatar will get in. In a later date. I'm just going to leave it there. All right. Mm-hmm. Yes. I'm, I was glad that Nine Inch Nails got in, though. So I'm yes. very, happy, very happy about that. All right. So as for me, of course, at Charles Skaggs on Twitter, at Charles Skaggs on Instagram, Facebook, of course, Charles Skaggs in Hilliard, Ohio, and my blog of geeky things. Come on, you. Damn good coffee. And hot. Damn good coffee and hot. We're talking about yes. all the stuff we talk about here on Next Stop Everywhere, your Doctor Who, your Torchwood, your Sarah Jane Adventures, all kinds of kind of book sci-fi news, uh, news of my other podcasts that I do for the Southgate Media Group, including the aforementioned Phantom Zone podcast, and that's F-A-N-D-O-M, not the other. And so, uh, yeah, we talk about, obviously, comic book TV shows. We talked about that. We're going to be talking Crisis Part 2. Um, you know, parts three and, or excuse me, parts four and five. Well, j- like Jesse said, so DJ Nick, you're on notice. We're going to be talking about those, obviously, and uh, obviously Titan Talk, the Titans podcast, and Ghostwood, the Twin Peaks podcast. They do with Zan Sprouse, life of comic book artist Chris Sprouse, where we talk about all things Twin Peaks, David Lynch, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And currently, we're going to be we we talked about Twin Peaks: The Return Part Nine. We did our commentary for that. And next time we're going to be doing our starting our deep dive into the new Twin Peaks from Z to A Ooh. complete series in Twin Peaks Fire Walk with Me Blu-ray set. Nice. So with this big giant cube of Twin Peaks goodness. So we're kind of going to dig deep into that. We'll probably do that for a couple of episodes and uh, give you all the skinny details on that. So mm-hmm. please check yes. that out. Uh, we have a lot of fun going through those extra features. Um, apart from that, next time on Next Stop Everywhere, we're going to talk Nikola Tesla's Night of Terror. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm a little shaky on that title. I would have just called it The Night of Terror. But, yes. Uh, that would, feels like more like a Doctor Who title to me. But we have a new writer to Doctor Who. That we'll talk about next time. That's episode four of series 12. And in this one, it's 1903. And on the edge of Niagara Falls, slowly I turned. Um, That's an old joke. Uh, So if you're a Three Stooges fan, you you get that joke. Um, Something is wrong at Nikola Tesla's generator plant where someone or something, because, hey, it's Doctor Who, is sabotaging the Maverick inventor's work. Has Tesla really received a message from Mars? And where does this great where does his great rival Thomas Edison fit into these events? The Doctor yes. and her companions Yaz, Ryan, and Grandma join forces with one of history's greatest minds to save both him and planet Earth. Oh, nice! So that's I'm looking next forward week. to that. I'm looking forward to that too, especially uh, Philip Glenister, who was an actor I was a big fan of on. The BBC's Life on Mars. Yes. Uh, he's going to be playing Thomas Edison next week. So I'm okay. really, li- I am looking forward to that. And um, I was interested in Nikola Tesla. I love David Bowie playing him in The Prestige. Yes, that was and really well done. So um, not just because I'm a big Bowie fan, but I um, always find this uh, Nikola Tesla a very interesting uh, historical figure and, uh, and, and science uh, aficionado. So, yes. uh, so definitely looking forward to that. Uh, everybody come on back. Episode 168. Uh, Jesse, anything else before we start? No, off? uh, no, it was fun talking to you. Um, a, um, you know, even an average, uh, who episode we could spend over an hour talking. Exactly. So. <laughs> All right. Exactly. So, uh, don't yeah. think we shortchanged you. All right. So everybody, exactly. thank you so much for listening and, and thank you all new listeners. 
Uh, we definitely pre- like Adrian. We really appreciate it. And everybody, come on back. Episode 168. We're going to talk Nikola Tesla's Night of Terror right here on Next Stop Everywhere, the Doctor Who podcast. Goodbye, everybody. Goodbye. Goodbye.